Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Yarwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lin Tamande. Crisis of Faith, episode 169. Zakia Lintamande. If Keltham has still not grasped the concept of power distance at all, then he might be slightly confused when the woman whose bid was accepted walks into the room, takes in Feyanar, and immediately and gracefully kneels. I'm going to give you share language, baseline, so I can pick up baseline vocabulary while Keltham talks to you, he says cheerfully, and taps her through her sleeve. It's a very good language. They invented it themselves. Keltham out of Dath Ilan. Why'd you suddenly kneel, kneel? If all women have to do that every time they enter a room, I'm giving up on Osirian and moving this operation to Rahadum. It's because that's the Prince Feyanar. Uh, she struggles for an honorific and isn't turning up any powerful person. Men would kneel too. I really hadn't read Feyanar as the type. As a prince? You can tell from the robes they're more expensive than other people's and not standardized like the priests. Wait. So people are also supposed to do that with, like, Marenre. What do people have to do when the pharaoh walks by, flop all the way onto the floor? Well, yes, powerful person. You don't have to speak baseline. The spell is that so I can speak baseline to you, and Feyanar can listen and pick up my intonations and signal me any time I use a vocabulary word he doesn't recognize so I can define it and add it to his set. Would I be correct if I conjectured that Feyanor has multiple times tried to get people to stop doing this to him, and been shot down every time? Shot down, ignored, counter-argued, dismissed. She'll switch back to Osiriani. I don't know, sir. It's bad for everyone's law if they stop following all the rules just because the rules are arbitrary and stupid. So it's a bit rude to tell them to, and I only do it when it's really, really wasting a lot of time. Law is exactly not doing stuff that's arbitrary and stupid, unless you, like, really want to or something. I'd ask if Phrasma has a way to submit bug reports, that stories about an error in the system and what you were doing when you got the error, for her alignment system, but I'd guess going on the general tenor of Galerion that the answer is no, but not the primary topic. I have, at this point, gotten somewhat different stories on women getting some sort of weird treatment in Osirian, from sources that included my chelish girlfriend, a seventh circle priest of Abadar, who was actually an illusion being operated by my chelish girlfriend, a couple of books that were secretly edited by people acting under the orders of my chelish girlfriend, and some brief confusing conversations in actual Osirion, suggesting that a lot of what my chelish girlfriend said was actually true. So like, what the actual ass is going on here? What are they doing? What's their stated reasons for doing it? And why do women put up with it? Women can become pregnant, and men can't. I assume you knew that, and it's not the answer that you're looking for, but it'd be an unkind abuse of your time. If trying to sound clever, I neglected to say that part first. Oh, we definitely want to start with the basics here, yes. My home dimension has pregnancies, they take nine months, and afterwards you want to breastfeed the kid for a couple of years. It doesn't have involuntary pregnancies, because everybody has constant contraception running, and two people need to deliberately turn it off in order for anybody to get pregnant. I do not think, however, that removing all the contraception from my home dimension would cause women to stop being able to own property. If we then further reduced everyone's income by a factor of 100, women would still be able to own property. If we reduced everybody's intelligence by seven, and deleted everybody's knowledge of math, I'd still expect that women would end up able to own property, because, like, why wouldn't they? So I'm guessing that it has something to do with magic and gods and afterlives, somehow. I'm actually not sure it does, sir. Say you have a farm, and in that farm, they live off grain that grows by the river, and only men are strong enough to pull the plow and plant the grain. Boy children are valuable, as they'll grow up to be able to work the farm. Girl children aren't valuable because they need to eat and they can't grow grain. If that family has twins in a year when there's not enough grain, they'll expose the girl and raise the boy. He's a better investment, right? Why not take the same logic further? By hypothesis, girl children have less value than boy children, so kill all the girl children all the time. Seems like a more sustainable long-term strategy if boys could, in fact, get pregnant. They'd rather not kill their girl children because people don't like killing their children and... Also, it's evil, so they won't do it unless it's a year where there's not enough grain. But yes, if there's been a famine, then when those boys grow up, 
they'll have trouble finding wives, and that'll make having girls more appealing. And that balances out. Though where it balances out depends on how much women can contribute to the production of food, and it's different in different places. Anyway, what you can do with girl children, if there's more than one farm in this story of ours, is marry them out. Girls are a luxury. Farms that are producing an excess of grain because they've got better land or better luck or a smidge of magic can afford them. They're not very much of a luxury. They come close to earning their keep. And, of course, people do want wives and heirs. So if they're running a little bit of margin, on the grain, they'll look to take a wife. In places where a woman is an economic liability, her parents will pay her husband to take her from them. There are also places where a woman is an economic asset and her husband pays her parents for her. But we're not talking about those. So if I can improve iron forging and steel making techniques and produce sharper plows that can cut the land easily enough for a woman to push them, the entire current system of gender relations is upset? Carissa would like that not thinking that. Yes, sir. There are other things going on, but they are all things that built up around the fact that women are weaker than men and that they're frequently pregnant and that under normal conditions, at least where I grew up, it's less in a family's interest to keep a daughter alive than a son. Where I come from, people with one SD think of SD is square root of the average square deviation from average. Think of is a broader metric that includes intelligence and wisdom and some other things. Tended to usually be less economically productive and earn lower salaries than people with plus one SD think of. We didn't like exclude the minus one S from owning property. In your terms, that'd be intelligence 14S or 15S, who are less productive than intelligence 18S and 19S. So our farm hasn't gotten around to owning property yet, sir. It's got a man and his wife and their children, only they married out the daughters, so their sons and their sons' wives. In most places, the land is actually owned by a noble far away, who everyone pays tribute to, and no one in this story can own property. But perhaps the pharaoh has come to Sothis, and declared independence from the Kelishites and told all their nobles to go back to Kadira and told the farmers that land you work, now it is not owned by distant nobles, but every farm is owned by the family that works it. And the head of each family can go to the temple of Abadar and get documents of ownership of their land. Back up. Property doesn't just mean land. It means the clothes you wear, the food your land produces, some of which you trade for shoes, shoes, foot clothes. Can women own that, or is it just that they can't own land? Or did the faraway nobles also own all the food crops and shoes produced? And if so, how did anybody get shoes? The nobles own the food crops, sir, though if they have any sense they leave you enough to survive on. They own the livestock, I think, in most places that have nobles. The house makes or trades for clothes to wear, and those I don't think the nobles usually take. If they're reasonably well off, the woman has shoes, though there's certainly no court she could go to if her husband for some strange reason took her shoes from her. Even if they're poor, she has her wedding jewelry he gave her when he took her as his wife, and that's hers. If he steals it from her or makes her sell it all, their friends would condemn him and warn him he might not make Axis conducting himself like that. In modern Osirian, she could go to a court if he took her wedding jewelry. When people say that women can't own property in Osirian, they don't mean that she does not wear clothes, and they mostly don't know about the wedding jewelry. That's not a custom in other places. They mean that the land and the food crops are legally owned by the household, as are any profits they've saved from last year's food crops, and that the household is headed by her husband, except in cases where she's been widowed without adult sons or something. Because the men are physically stronger and formed a collective faction that violently subjugated the women. And women here are not well-coordinated enough to stab all the men like that in their sleep. I guess that's harder if you literally don't own knives. No, you've got plows. You should have other sharp objects. If we stabbed all the men, we'd starve, sir. Because of the thing where grain farming requires male strength levels. Okay. I'm not seeing a way out of that one. The last time I had this conversation, I was under the impression that, okay, you just went to the afterlife. But if killing people is evil, and then you go to hell, that's not much of an option either, is it? I'd say, see, it reduces to afterlives after all. Except that in Doth Ilan, where afterlives don't exist. No, in Doth Ilan, 
If you're this far back in technological time, you know you're dying the true death at the end of your life no matter what. So you might as well stab the man exploiting you and die immediately instead of living a little longer while being exploited. Okay, it is about the afterlives and the alignment system. That checks. Women often also don't want to kill their husband because their children need a father and they don't want their children to starve and then to never see them again. The afterlives are important, but it would be a hard thing to say goodbye to your children forever, even if you know they'll go to the boneyard and won't be tortured there or anything. Even if I were sure of Axis, I wouldn't kill my husband unless he was a danger to me or the children, and I'd probably try other things first. Does your husband have the power to grant you the ability to own property? Or if not, does he track that? Your shoes are yours, within the larger property system that says they're his? There's such a thing as the right choice for a man to make, even in a situation like that. And if he's doing his best, or trying to a reasonable degree, you stab the people who do maintain the system, not your husband who's doing the best he can. Actually, I think you could probably get pretty far just stabbing the worst quarter of men every 15 years. Calistria, Linta Monday. Usually when clerics of Abadar have plans to tackle sexism, they are incredibly annoying plans that presume that everyone involved is just being a rational economic agent, and not hurting people for their own benefit because they want to. This one has unusually interesting plans to tackle sexism. That seems promising. Do not do anything with the anomaly. Do not add cleric levels to it. Do not make anyone around it a cleric. Do not drop four oracle levels on anyone especially if they are going to continue hanging around the anomaly. Ottolmens is trying to get the anomaly back in the anomaly containment zone, and meanwhile all of the gods should leave it alone, even if it is not in the zone right this time unit. If Ottolmens murders the worst quarter of men in the world, then there'd be no need to try to convince this random Abadaran to do it. Ottolmens will consider it if Calistria can arrange for the anomaly to go back in the anomaly containment zone. Ottolmens can figure out whether a mortal is a man without too much effort. Can Calistria define for Ottolmens which quarter of men are the worst ones? Well, I can't speak for anyone else, sir, but if people figured out who the worst quarter of men were and came to my house to kill my husband and sons, I'd stab them. A very reasonable attitude if your husband is not, like, making you work, keeping the stuff you make, and then not letting you trade it for things that you are then allowed to keep. If your husband is like that, oh wait, is this a perverted thing? A perversion making sex more complicated, like the Osirian equivalent of masochism? No, sir. I mean, obviously while you're trying to make your marriage work, you can end up in lots of weird places, but a normal young woman is not thinking, oh, I hope my husband's cruel to me. She's hoping he's reasonable and hardworking and makes her rich and doesn't hit her without provocation. Okay. I was about to ask if I was coming at this the wrong way, and the whole system was voluntary, and maybe you could just opt out by cutting your hair in a locally stereotypically masculine hairstyle, and then you'd be allowed to have your own money. But that is again sounding like the women are being forced by violence into a system where they're not having fun, and they'd prefer a different system. Well, it depends on the different system. Saren Ray's church fights for women's concerns in Garand and Kazmaron. They say things like that, we should raise the minimum age of marriage. And if a man was poor when he married but is rich ten years later, he should be obliged to buy his wife more wedding jewelry. And that a man shouldn't be allowed to take a second wife if his first one says he's lousy. Those would all be popular if you asked women. If you ask whether we want things to be like they are in Avistan, where everyone's a whore. No, I've talked to women who want that, but only two of them and I've done orientation for hundreds of new concubines. I wish everyone in Avistan was a sex worker. I had one girlfriend who'd name a price for anything in either direction, and the rest were like, oh no, if we're ever financially legible to Keltham, we'll be in the same reference class category as women who get pregnant and die in the street even though we are all at least second circle wizards who know alter self. Though I suppose that all could have been a lie. And if it was... I will be annoyed even considering everything else they lied to me about. I'd just arrived from another dimension and had barely any idea what a gold piece was worth, and nobody in Cheliax would tell me whether sex here was valued at like one copper or a thousand gold pieces or what. Sorry, none of that is your problem, but I'm not getting what the connection is between Canone things and his sex worker. 
is the idea that if women own things, they will inevitably realize they can trade sex for money. Side note, Fei Anar. Most men and women in Dathilan have both paid for and sold sex at some point. The word sex worker actually means a professional good enough to make a living at it. But I'm repurposing it to mean has ever been paid for sex, since baseline doesn't have a native word for horror. And side note, Fei Anar. So, in Osirian, most women will only lie with a man if he's married her. There are prostitutes, they're not illegal, but there's not many, and you certainly can't bring them to parties, and they're not a very appealing substitute for a long-term romantic relationship. So, if a man wants a serious relationship and regular access to a woman's bed, he'd better make himself a good candidate for marriage and then go persuade someone to marry him. Marriage is a lifelong commitment. A man promises to provide for his wife and for any children she bears him, to pay for treatment if she's sick within whatever his abilities are, to provide her with a home and protect her and her children from danger, and to greet her with love. In return, a woman promises to obey her husband, to steward his money wisely and raise his children well, to be faithful to him and to greet him with love. Some marriages break down, and the couple ends up living separately or barely speaking to each other. But still, they are bound by these promises, and a woman can go to the Osirian state if her husband isn't providing for her family, and get money drawn out of his bank account if he has one, and get him prevented from remarrying. Because of all this, it's actually very rare for even a girl child to be left outside to die of exposure when she's born. You marry someone who can provide for your children, and then your children don't starve. That is the whole promise here that if you refrain from recklessly having sex without the safety of marriage, then you won't have to watch your children starve. In Avistan, they don't do any of that very much. Some girls will have sex with you even when you haven't married them. Because some girls can do that, no girls can hold out for a lifelong promise to provide for them. Why would a man offer them that when he could just go, have sex with all the girls who offer it for free? No one would get married, so they made a sort of fake marriage that you can break at any time and they all do that. Women are, in a sense, freer. They aren't chaperoned. Because no man will provide for them, it's more important for their families to figure out how they'll provide for themselves, so more of them are financially independent, though also many, many more of them starve, or are killed by a man they trusted and shouldn't have, or die of an abortion. Many of them feel that there's something wrong, something missing, that things shouldn't be like this. But those ones simply don't lie with anyone at all. They can't find any men who'd be worth trusting. Our society demands virtue of men and virtue of women and constrains them so that they can't do whatever they like, but they won't go hungry. Avistan demands no virtue of anyone and they do as they like and they kill the babies that result and then they go to hell or Abaddon or the abyss and it just doesn't sound like a very good trade. Really, if you say the wrong things about women's liberation, People think you're proposing they raise their girls into Avistani whores, by which I don't even mean they pay for sex, just that they offer it outside of marriage. And they'll hate that idea and stop listening to you. So it's a conspiracy by the women themselves to prevent competition between women and maintain sex at an artificially high price, allegedly for the sake of raising children, because otherwise why would any man pay to raise a child? And the men are also trapped in that it sounds like to me. The husbands beat the wives. The wives, I assume, beat any woman who tries what I'd consider normal dating. Check. You don't beat someone. If she's gone around sleeping with men, you just stay away from her. It'll ruin her life, but not because anyone did anything. I guess you tell your sons not to marry her because she has terrible impulse control and is probably infertile? and then she ends up in an awful afterlife, which is, I suppose, what underpins the whole system, what Phrasma arbitrarily defines as evil or chaotic. Callistria is chaotic neutral, not because she's doing something contrary to decision theory, but because decision theory itself, as correctly applied by female sex workers, is opposed to Asmodean Osirian power relations, which are lawful evil and lawful neutral, respectively. You know, Cheliax tried to sell me on a bunch of sexual behaviors like that being evil, but apparently that was a false advertisement for evil, and they were actually just lawful. I guess that makes sense. Abadar wouldn't have clericked me if he wasn't on board with my sadism. No, sir. Whatever they do in Cheliax is definitely evil. Marriage is lawful, 
It's structuring your life around a promise made to protect the long-term interests of both parties. Cheliacs doesn't have that, because they don't want people promising to protect and care for one another. They were pretending not to be evil. Or rather, they were pretending about what evil was. Supposedly, Carissa was going to obey me, and wanted to obey me, and wanted me to be in charge, wanted me to be cruel to her and hit her. I'll have to check the transcripts for what she said under Osirian Verified Truth Spell, but it sounded like maybe that part was not a lie. And I had qualms about this. Qualms, a sense that something violates your deontology, deontology, simple rules you obey instead of calculating out the exact consequences of things, which is why I did not buy her from Cheliax, when Cheliax offered her to me, and now I do not have her, which I don't even know now if that was good or bad. But it sounds like basically the same thing you have in Osirian, except that, at least the way they presented it, Carissa wanted to be hit, and wasn't trying to corner me into that relationship via a monopoly on sex enforced by ostracizing women who try to go on dates and preventing them from fleeing your country by not letting them earn money or own things. Keltham can now talk about this without having a crying fit. Good for Keltham. He will probably be fairly recovered by tomorrow at this rate. I don't think that's the thing we have in Osirian, sir. If you retain the option to get bored, or meet someone better, or get angry with her, and leave her as soon as you feel like it, then that's nothing like marriage. Osirians would have told you that you could take this woman as your wife, if she desired it, and you desired it, and that she would obey you and be faithful to you. And if hitting your wife worked out well for your marriage, then by all means you should do so. And in exchange, you would be committing to protect her, to see that she didn't go hungry, to arranging her shelter and medical care, and supporting the children. I would have done that anyways. It would not need to be enforced upon me. Feanor, and your name was on the price list sheet, but I don't remember it. Please excuse me and leave me alone for a few minutes. I will come out when it's okay for you to come back. Never mind that part about not having a crying fit. But nobody could blame Keltham at this point. He is still definitely doing better than yesterday. They'll step out into the hallway then. It's a bad one. Keltham wants to scream, or maybe just let out a thin wailing sound. But he does not have a silent spell chambered, and the area does not look particularly soundproofed. Possibly he should start carrying around a silent scroll. Sorry about the delay. Let's resume. Yes, sir. Feanor, what's sir mean in Osirian? It's a generic, uh, title used to indicate respect and importance. Not worth arguing over. So I think I have a basic model of what went wrong. I am very sure, going on how my whole society worked, and also the way I feel, that I would not need this. Baseline, of course, does not have a word for blasphemy. Awful setup. To be convinced to take care of my kids. Why? Because though we don't know our history anymore, Dathilan would not have had this setup. Dads who didn't take care of their kids, just had fewer kids, until there were fewer dads like that. You set up a situation so that men who didn't care about their children could be forced to take care of their children anyways. You set up a way for men like that to be reproductively competitive with men who just cared. And that, in fact, was a mistake. Over in Absalom, where, as I understand it according to some things people have said in Osirian, men and women are not forcing themselves to behave this way. Do you know how many surviving children the average man or woman has, on average, including all the men and women who just don't have kids in the first place? Two. And do you know what the number in Osirian is? Two. Any other number, and the population quickly goes to zero or infinity. But that's not what actually happens. If the number goes up or down, what happens is that there's fewer people working better land, so that fewer of their children starve or people more crowded in cities with more epidemics, until the number goes back to roughly two. That's what all of this awfulness bought you in the end. Two surviving children per man, two surviving children per woman, on average. But in Absalom, sir, that number is bought with tons of dead children, and abortions, and in Assyrian it isn't, and that seems much better. Assyrian's population is actually growing, and has been since independence. It's three close to four surviving children per woman. Keltham did not understand why woman, whose name he forgot, was mentioning abortions in the same breath as dead children, unless Feanor has a contagious misapprehension about the baseline meaning of the term, and she is trying to say dead infants, since neither fetuses nor infants have qualia. 
Or maybe she was expressing abortions to include dead infants and distinguishing dead children. That would make sense. But why is abortion even a bad thing on these relative scales? Keltham is in the middle of expressing a different important-seeming thought, and fails to chase down this slight note of confusion because he does not know exactly which slight notes of confusion are important, and he has been feeling them almost constantly throughout this conversation. I'd say good for Osirian, except for the part where that's not actually a figure of merit. Civilization could easily have ten kids per couple if we wanted there to be five billion people in twenty years, but that is not, in fact, a desideratum. So I can guess where the next arc of the story is going at this point. Turns out, everywhere on Galarian is awful in different ways. Lawful is not. Careful reasoning. And good is not light. Galarian probably doesn't have a concept for that. And somehow I'm supposed to build civilization out of that from scratch, rather than being given an overly convenient existing base to build on anywhere. The Golilani need their own territory aren't able to fit into any existing system. They're recruited from the misfits of all the existing regions. What's horribly wrong with Lastwall? Yomadai seemed cool. For that matter, the god I prayed to is not a god who would countenance anyone not being allowed to keep stuff they make it and trade it with others. What's he supposed to do about bad husbands, sir? Smite them with lightning, so then their families starve? Let people escape. Consider that your personal favorite system does not work for everyone. There are always weirdos, and they need to have a right to exist. Build an exception handler, a way for weird things to not be total errors inside the system, into your region's clever regulations. That's step one. Any woman who wants it can go get herself registered as not in the system, and maybe that means she can never have a husband inside Osirion. Any man who wants to date her maybe has to go get registered as not in the system, and can never have a wife from inside the system. Fine. You can protect your closed system of people for whom that system works. They have a right not to be around people who aren't part of their favorite system. But if someone doesn't want to be inside the system, let them out. You can petition to be the head of your own household, including as a woman. Though you have to actually be financially independent, you can't do it if someone else is feeding and sheltering you. And you can get on a ship to Absalom if you want. It's not illegal to leave. No. No rules like that. Just let them out of the system. In Dathilan, yes, this is as simple as just getting on a vehicle to a different city. If the nearest different cities were on the moon, meaning even in civilization most people couldn't afford a ticket there without a lot of saving, you'd need an escape option that people can actually reasonably take before regions could be allowed to pass fun, clever regional regulations about perverted marriage arrangements where the women can't have money. Well, sir, I expect you'll get what you want, but I don't really expect anyone will thank you for it. If nobody would thank me for it, then nobody would invoke the newly installed exception handler, and everything would be exactly the same. Am I missing another Galarian doom fact here? I don't know, sir, but it wouldn't surprise me if we follow all the people who get declared the heads of households they have no means to support, if almost all of them regretted it immensely ten years later, and if they mostly didn't make axis, and if their children mostly died. Doesn't Osirian have? No, it recently developed prediction markets. Prediction markets. And there's still one guy, Marenre, whose guesses are just better than the markets. Are you running experiments? Has anyone at any point said, I'd like to set up a tiny piece of Avistan inside Osirian and collect a bunch of men and women who strongly want out of the current system and see what happens with them, and we'll run early judgment on all of them in ten years, and we'll pay to turn the ones who aren't heading towards an acceptable afterlife into statues pending Keltham and or Iomade doing something about the evil afterlives. That sort of thing. Can't afford that. But we do household and population surveys, and then scry a sample after they die to see where they ended up, to try to have a better understanding of what laws and social conditions work best to get people to axis. Is this entire planet some kind of ass-forsaken moral homily about how the only important thing in life is money, because without that, you're too poor to do things? I really think you'd do better, sir, if you stopped trying to look for morals and the next arc of the story, and tried asking people what would make their lives better if you want to help them. Yes. And the answer I got back from you is that somebody who says, Keltham, please stop helping the Osirian government until they let me earn and spend wealth, like the god you thought you were addressing would have wanted, is making a terrible mistake. And if I help them, 
they'll end up in hell or the maelstrom. No, sir. That's not at all what I'm saying. If you find that person and do what that person asks, you'll be doing much better than you are now. Fair enough. If you tell me to go collect evidence first, I'm not going to not go collect it. Feanor, or can you actually just tell me your name again? Do either of you know what I'd be liable to find horribly wrong about Lastwall or Mendev? Like, what's their own variant of horribly perverted gender relations that can't be altered because something very bad will happen if anybody tries? Zack, yes, sir. There are some paladins here to see you if you want, and you could ask them about Last Wall. I think Last Wall just tries to encourage everyone to be celibate. Is that objectionable? Depends on how they do the encouraging, and what happens to anyone who defies the system, and if there's any realistic way out for people who don't fit. Yomedy seems cool, but I would have thought the same about the god I tried contacting, and look at Osirian. And now I'm wondering if Asmodeus is nicer than Cheliax. Imaginable, but improbable, since you'd expect afterlives to move in the direction of gods' preferences compared to their influenced Galarian regions, e.g. the putatively Axis city I saw in early judgment seemed like a brighter place than Osirion, and putative hell in my vision did not look nicer than Cheliax. I'm about to head into Sothis. Do you have recommendations on evidence I should gather while I'm out, according to you, in order to understand things better? Do I just randomly sample women on the street and ask them if they'd prefer to be able to own property, get uniformly no, maybe try verifying one case with a truth spell to make sure they're not being forced to lie, and then that proves your point? What I would do, sir, is tell them you're a priest of Abadar, collecting information on how women in Sothis engage in commerce and trade, because then... They won't be bothered you're talking to them, and they won't be as tempted to lie to you. And then I'd ask them, in your household, who does the finances? Why? Would you want your daughters to do the finances in their marriage? Do you earn money? Does your husband spend your money on drink? If you'd had the right to form your own household and be independent before you got married, would you have done that? Do you think that would have worked out well? If you had the right to all the money you earned, and your husband had the right to all the money he earned, do you think that'd make things better or worse? If you could change one thing about your husband, what would it be? I'll have to think about whether I consider that introduction true, and also not misleading. I'm also going to have to do that at one remove, like have Feanor ask or something, if you don't want it to be really obvious that I am a priest of Abadar from another dimension. Because otherwise, that's going to be pretty obvious. There's no way I look native, even with glibness running. I suppose I could say I'm not from anywhere near Garund, and have that be true. That also brings up another topic, though I suspect it's more of a Feanar topic. I intend to pay back what Abadar invested in me in all good faith. But do arrangements fall apart in Osirion if I'm no longer a cleric of Abadar? I'd still be happy to take any number of truth spells, if that brings my continuing reliability into question. You don't have to stop being a cleric of Abadar if you think we're fixing Osirian too slowly. Many clerics of Abadar think that, and they write papers arguing for how to fix it faster. If you declare you want nothing to do with the church because it's insufficiently committed to fairness and trade, then Abadar will keep giving you cleric spells. That's breaking from the church in rather the right direction. I would try to keep in mind that Osirian is a much, much better place to live than it was a hundred years ago for everybody. And it's a hard problem we're trying to solve. And everyone has been so excited for your arrival here because you can help us fix it faster. And I will help you fix it faster, regardless of whether it looks like the ancient inhuman god thing is something I should go on trading with. But the story sure seems to be heading in a direction where I end up having to do all of this while being very alone. There's not a story, sir. And if you alienate everybody, you won't be able to fix everything. Asmodeus said, under Osirian's supervised truth spell, that the tropes were probably real, that she'd been temporarily turned into a dragon, that a god gave her a permanent plus one intelligence boost, and that she was in fact asexual, someone who doesn't experience sexual desire, and had ended up as the one who stands back and watches it all. Nefredi Klopati said she'd explain things to Ioni once they were off screen. And no matter what the in-world rationalization, the fact remains that Galarian contains damage-resistant masochists. You'd need some context to get all that. But I think there's a story. Keltham is still trying to figure out how to make use of the fact. 
Most stories where the characters know they're in a story resist being easily manipulated by the characters, and sometimes the story makes an example out of the first character who tries, or warns them off, in a way that discourages anyone from trying again. Do not mess with tropes and all that. Was Nefreti trying to convince you, sir? Or trying to convince Cheliax? But that's not the important bit, actually. Not really. You remind me of the pharaoh. Not this one. His predecessor, his grandfather. He was a good man, as far as that goes. Osirian grew wealthier under his rule, and that's what matters. But no one else was ever properly real to him. When they spoke, they were just delivering the latest development in his story, the story of his rule. When they wept, it was a test to see if he was compassionate. When there was a famine, the gods had cursed him to try his commitment. When his baby died, he was paying for his hubris. I suppose I don't have a counter-argument, if that's how you want to see the world. Doesn't sound like a happy character, does it? But this story is not apparently setting up for me to be happy, and at that point, if you're to go on playing at all, it makes more sense to speedrun the story as quickly as possible and hope it ends with me and Carissa together again than drag it out by futilely trying to be happy during the Osirian arc. I guess I don't know that's the obvious strategy the way it would be inside a Dathilani story. This sure isn't a Dathilani story, Medium. We couldn't send true dead people to places where a priori unlikely events would happen around them, and the tropes are not quite right. A priori unlikely. Things you wouldn't have expected before you saw them. There's a more precise technical meaning, but it takes math to explain. Anyways, there's only one possible answer to that argument, in Dathilan or anywhere else, if you're reasoning validly, in a way where conclusions follow from premises. If the world is a story, I desire to believe it is a story. If the world is not a story, I desire not to believe it is a story. Let me not become attached to beliefs I may not want. Whether the belief will make me happy or unhappy does not enter into it. In a Galarian story, sir, the person who is treating everyone around them as interchangeable faces and every major event that affects billions of people as a message from the gods for them personally isn't just a sad character. They also lose, because when it matters they weren't paying attention to which of the servants stole a princess's jewellery to pawn for a removed disease for their sick baby, and which of the king's advisers is glad they're here, and which is unendorsedly resentful of how much money he lost on the betting markets about them, and who has a crush on them, and who is painfully reminded of their dead brother, and who overheard them talking about contraception, and is resisting the urge to immediately shake them down and get an explanation of how to do it, and who wants to help them whatever it takes, and who wants to help them so long as it doesn't destroy Sathis, and who will keep going with or without them. My reluctance to think like I was in a story, my wanting to believe my apparent world was real so I could be happy there, is why Galarian is now facing down a Cheliax, which, thanks to me, is scaling up the ability to produce spell silver and intelligence headbands at a tenth of the current cost. Your people are alien to me. I am here with you, trying to understand them, and when I try, the message I get back is, this is huge and broken and full of children torturing each other, and those children don't want you fixing them. And if reality's going to throw tiny detective stories at me on top of that, then this so-called reality can burn. Pick a different protagonist, because there are limits to how much I'm willing to suffer for a world that might not be real at all. I was supposed to be selfish. It was my thing. I see, sir. I apologize for inflicting my overt emotions on you. I don't need to be yelling at you. I need to be plotting out a path through time to destroying Asmodeus. I think I should be getting along to Sothis now. Do you get to keep the five silver, or does somebody grab it away from you as soon as I'm not looking anymore? Actually, in this specific case, I go talk to the pharaoh, and then he compensates me whatever the difference is between the five silver you pay me and what I would have charged if I'd known what this was going to be like. Uh-huh. Well, I'm not going to offer to pay you more, though I got more than five silver worth of value here on my own end. Because if you predictably pay upwards, then people just bid downwards. But you get to keep the money? Yes. Recalculating recent evidential updates in light of this important fact. I'll take your advice and head into Sothis to see if I can talk with a female that Osirian considers a woman and I will ask them what they'd have Osirian's fate be. Meanwhile in Chiliax, 
you might possibly get an overly rosy picture of how happy and functional a place Cheliacs was, on average, if a. you were inside a fortress being run by Carissa Sever, and b. you were all carefully presenting a happy, functional face to a Dathilani who might notice any subtle departures from that picture. It is now full two days since both of these conditions abruptly ceased to obtain inside the Fortress of Law. People are being idiots. Would it kill them? Would it damn them to Abaddon? To wait a few weeks until Sevar gets back from her punishment? To make any changes to this perfectly good status quo? Unfortunately, as Mylol knows all too well, if you are not literally at the world wound, then there are limits to how useful it can be to try to clamp down on friction between your subordinates. If you let dominance challenges resolve themselves, your subordinates resolve themselves into a stable, low-tension arrangement where everyone knows who's stronger, and the stronger ones are in charge. Anything you do to influence affairs away from that creates a higher tension arrangement which you, as superior, will have to do ongoing work to maintain. Mayol can foresee Sevar not being incredibly happy with this unfortunate bit of project manager wisdom, nor feeling fully answered by the observation that they are supposed to be less heretical Asmodians henceforth. But if Sevar didn't want this to happen, the moment she stepped out, she should have spent three rounds casting to prepare for it, frankly. The slave population in the Fortress of Law has been forced into unnatural arrangements for quite some time now. Some minor strife now will provide both a natural release of those tensions and an excuse to correct any unfortunate qualities of the resulting arrangement. When Sevar returns from her recovery vacation with the Queen, besides, it will probably be good for Sevar, a start on her new Asmodeanism, if she returns to a situation that requires her to correct her slaves with fire and lash. Mayal and Subirak seem to be inclined in different directions about this. Fascinating. A story you could tell about Project Lawful. Not the only story you could tell about Project Lawful, certainly. But a story you could tell about Project Lawful goes like this. A man arrived from another world that had a bizarre, math-inspired form of social organization and also a really extensive knowledge of chemical processes and how to improve them. He believed, apparently with complete sincerity, that the two went hand in hand, that the chemistry was a byproduct of the math-inspired form of social organization, though it was invented back in his society's screened-off history. As a result, Cheliac set its people not just to learning chemistry, but also to trying to master his world's math-inspired form of social organization. This was a mistake. It's not that being interested in the math-inspired form of social organization was a mistake, Hell seems interested. They all serve Hell. That is enough reason to try to grasp it. But you can also just take the parts that are about how to iterate on chemical processes and then get really rich and conquer the world. And in terms of order of operations, that one is really the important one. Especially since no one has figured out how the math-inspired form of social organization is compatible with Asmodianism while getting really rich and conquering the world is entirely compatible with Asmodianism. Asmodia, not that the Lady Avaricia would contemplate criticizing her in the slightest, is obviously one of the major drivers of this mistake. She was the subject of some kind of divine intervention, cementing everyone's sense that she's very important. She's not particularly talented at improving industrial processes. She was utterly necessary while they had Keltham around because the math-inspired form of social organization was important for lying to people who rely on it. But she's from the beginning conceived of the whole project as being about Elanism, instead of as being about getting rich and conquering the world. Much the same could be said of Savar, but Avaricia does not say it, for it is said, don't criticize your superiors without a plan to take their job, and she has noticed that Savar's job involves a lot of being personally tortured by the Queen of Cheliax. Did Avaricia say that she was organizing a new faction inside Project Lawful, comprised of the real Asmodeans who clearly deserve to be running things while those open heretics burn in hell, 
or at least suffer a little under their natural superiors. That's a touch unsubtle, really. Yes. Yes, commoners have to be idiots. But do they have to be as idiotic as they always are? She might say, though, that Sevar did suggest that open heresy was going to be less tolerated, going forward. And Asmodia does not seem to have fully comprehended that reprimand, which suggests the project might be wanting for competent, loyal, non-heretical leadership, who correctly understand the primary objective of the project as conquering the world for Asmodeus, and who have justifiably been chafing under Asmodea's heretical and also incompetent direction. Okay, you're now the church faction, which would make Asmodea's faction the crown faction. Shit. Asmodea, aspire to ambition, I R Wayne. They prefer the term Sevar loyalists, actually. Asmodea is not in charge of the Sevar loyalists. They are sufficiently intelligent to compute their own best interests in unison and move in coordination. They may not be Elani as yet, but there is no point in letting themselves fall that far short of Elani. That's an interesting, not Asmodean, not at all functional way to run a project. She wishes them good luck at it. Asmodeus's loyalists will be following orders. They'll punish heresy, because actually, heresy is bad. And heresy on this project has distracted it from what should be its single-minded aim on improving chemical processes. Those of them who are officially Asmodia's subordinates will obey her. Because that's what Asmodians do, until such a time as they can arrange a transfer to work under a real Asmodian and not a heretic. It's an excellent bet that when Sevar returns to define what new behavior patterns on Project Lawful will be considered heretical, she will not walk back what she previously said about needing an Asmodeanism based on truth in order for Cheliax to successfully compete against the non-Asmodean rest of Golarion. Sever may impose new tyranny, possibly walk back her old edict about torture, but she's pretty unlikely to withdraw the project of an Asmodeanism based on truth. The Saver loyalist Ilani, then, will come right out and say the truth here, as Avaricia no doubt considers terribly boorish. Actual truth. Avaricia is making a play to steal project resources from Savar. Actual truth. Sever is the chosen of Asmodeus and the favored of Abigail Thrun, and anybody loyal to the church or crown would be loyal to Sevar. Asmodia is in fact loyal to neither, but she does feel that she owes Sevar a lot of loyalty, for now. And unless Sevar changes, actual truth, this sort of internal backbiting, erupting the instant there is, not a power vacuum, but a power slight depression, will, if the Chel Ilani can't get it under control, cause Cheliax to lose. Or are they under the impression that Doth Ilani projects behave like this? Asmodia would be pretty willing to sit back and eat cookies about this so long as Avaricia and her faction of power-hungry lunatics didn't do anything to interfere with the real work being carried on by Sivar loyalists. However, Avaricia, having now wantonly divided the project's loyalties and created internal conflict to serve her own purposes of gaining power, Asmodia rather suspects that some time-wasting conflicts will be inevitable. She will document every instance of those to be charged against the account of Lady Eulalia Avaricia de Seguer upon Carissa Sevar's return. They could have done something else which was not that. But alas, it takes two to cooperate in a cooperation defection dilemma. And if Cheliax cannot manage to cooperate with itself internally, well, it is a moot point whether Cheliax could have won. Because what Cheliax will do then could not really be called trying. Also, Avaricia isn't one of Keltham's fated love interests and favored of the tropes, so... Kind of a foregone conclusion here anyways. Asmodia will close by noting that if Avaricia was actually doing a better job of serving Asmodeus, she'd have Pilar Pineda on her side. So, nobody go pretending that what they're doing over there is really serving Asmodeus in any way. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash AI. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.